Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and our guest this week is El Monitor business correspondent, Salim Asid. Salim is the newest member of our team and based in the United Arab Emirates, where he reports about AI, fintech, sustainability, market trends, technology, innovation, and more. Salim previously worked as a broadcast journalist for Time, CNN, NHK World, AFP, and AP in the United States and Jordan, and as an on-air reporter for Euronews in the UAE. Salim and I will be talking about the Gulf's investments in esports, cryptocurrency, and AI governance, and why and how the region has become a hub for global climate policy and trends. And that conversation with Salim Asid begins now. Salim, welcome to On the Middle East. Thank you. You had an article last week about Saudi Arabia's interest in investment in esports, and you wrote that, and I'm quoting you, young, edgy, and female is the new face the conservative kingdom of Saudi Arabia is presenting to the world with esports. Tell us why the kingdom sees growth potential in this sector. Exactly. I mean, it's a different Saudi Arabia than we know. And uh, in the article, I highlight Najd Fahad, who was the first uh, FIFA global esports winner. And you know, this is just the beginning of their strategy. She was telling me how things have changed uh, on the ground in terms of she was able to play publicly. Uh, and then online over before she had to hide her identity. Uh, today, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia has announced its uh, esports strategy with 38 to create 4, 000, sorry 40,000 jobs um, and really develop the sector, cre creating 250 games by 2030. This is monumental for the country, and it's really a sign of you know, what the region is doing in different industries to really grow uh, with these strategies and visions. Why do you think it's esports that uh, the kingdom is willing to make that type of investment in? You mentioned in your article 39,000, 40,000 jobs. Is that realistic? And you also know in the piece that it's globally a 200, approximately $200 billion industry. So far, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia just has about a billion dollars of that. How do you see the growth potential? I think this is a testament to how countries in the GCC operate, where it's, which I think is sometimes more interesting than the happening itself. So speaking to analysts, and especially for that article, the, uh, and, and others related, the understanding is that in the Gulf, uh, because the system of government and the way of enacting, you know, these visions is different than, say, in a Western country, where um, private companies are uh, beholden to uh, quarterly earnings, uh, you know, when you can throw this much money at a vision and with a long term goal, uh, they can make mistakes in the short term and to yield a, res uh, a bigger result in the long term. So it's kind of a high risk, high reward type attitude where it's okay to make, even if they don't reach the goals in the short term, as long as they're reaching that in the long term, then it's worthwhile. And what the benefit of that is, is that it brings companies and entrepreneurs that are very forward thinking and want to act now, and they find that their ambition is matched by uh, the governance and the policies uh, provided by these governments, it's attracting those types of businesses. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how much of that strategy uh, Saudi Arabia actually performs and achieves you know, by 2030, but whether it does or not, I don't think that's the point. The idea is that they set that goal and they're heading in that direction and that's really helping them to leapfrog ahead you know, in this type of industry. Salim, you've also written on the cryptocurrency markets and the recent groundbreaking regulations by the UAE and Bahrain regarding uh, cryptocurrency. While the US, for example, is, is debating whether digital assets should be a commodity or a security, it seems at least these two countries in the Gulf, perhaps others, have uh, created quicker regulation and welcomed major crypto players, uh, including Binance and FTX. So uh, tell us where you see 
the crypto market in the Gulf and what that means for the trend in cryptocurrency worldwide. Definitely, and uh, you know the, the example you, you gave it just serves the uh, the product of the strategy that I was mentioning before, where you know as you said the um, you know in the U.S. for example the legislation around whether a uh, whether cryptocurrencies are a security or a commodity that debate is still taking place, while here the regulation has already been. Uh, you know, has already been established. Uh, they're already welcoming, uh, you know, crypto companies. You have Binance and you have other leaders in the cryptocurrency space that have set up shop in the UAE. And it, it, again, it's just an example of how they're taking action, this top-down type policy making with quick action and it's and bringing in the international investment and companies to the region. And the result of that is that they're, it's a testament to looking forward uh, in the industry. So, for example, uh, they have already established the UAE has established a Ministry of Finance in the metaverse. They see the metaverse as like the new oil. As we need to get ahead of this, we need to act now. And I think it's really you know showing that um, you know compared to global players. In your interview um, with the Minister of the Future and Development, uh, Her Excellency um, Rahoud uh, Al Rumi. You know, that's exactly what her uh, the project of the 50 is about. It's the country itself is the UAE is 50 years old, but they're already looking at the next 50 years where they're already planning ahead. They're planning these strategies. They're looking into space to uh, to bring in these technologies and move ahead. And it's and a point that uh, which I really like that you know she made when speaking to you was that the future is uncertain. The only thing that's certain is that it's changing. So their approach is no, we need to act now. We need to establish these policies, and this is attracting uh, companies that want that match that same ambition and want to produce. And that's I think what we're seeing in comparison to uh, you know other um, countries maybe with a different form uh, of government. You know each form of government has its positives and negatives, but one benefit of not having to debate everything is that things can be enacted. And uh, as we're seeing right now in the crypto space, you know, in the GCC as a whole. So Liam, I'm glad you mentioned our, our webinar with uh, Minister Ahud Al Rumi, the UAE Minister of the Future. We talked a fair bit in that conversation about AI tech governance and what the UAE is doing. And in this space. Tell us about the trends you're seeing, you're based in the UAE, uh, which it seems to be uh, that the Emirates is an incubator for AI applications, and not just in government, but also business as well. Definitely. I mean, I think to answer that, I would say, I don't know where it's not happening. I mean, it's in almost every single sector. Um, when you say tech, you know, we're, we're talking about agri-tech, we're talking about uh, fintech. Um, also, I mean, in Web3, you know, everything decentralized, you know, the UAE is really taking uh, the lead on that. And also, you know, with space, um, you know, in your uh, webinar conversation, even talking about looking at Venus, uh, as a goal, I mean, something which uh, I didn't think would be fathomable, fathomable in, in my lifetime, but even just having these ideas just shows, you know, how they're really investing in so many different areas. Um, just recently, um, they announced, you know, capital investment and in reverse osmosis technology for uh, desalinization, uh, which is better for the environment, but also, you know, solves a major issue here with water security. So, I mean, again, the, the answer is, uh, I don't know where it's not happening. It's really happening on an array of fields, you know, um, within the tech uh, and other industries as well. Salim, the Arab region is now the hub of global discussion of climate and sustainability. First, Egypt is hosting the UN Conference of Parties, um, the annual UN Conference on Climate Change. It's known as COP27 this year. Uh, that's going to be held in Sharm El Sheikh next month. And the UAE is hosting COP28, the summit next year on, on climate change. Uh, this is obviously tied to the issue of the shift toward renewables, but there are other variables in play, including food security and water supply, uh, mm -hmm. where supply chains have been disrupted by the Ukraine war. How is the Gulf in the region uh, navigating both the shift to renewables while also dealing with a, a global energy and global food crisis? 
exactly to your point that this is a I would say the Middle East is very central in uh, you know COP27 and uh, next year with COP28 and it's not just uh, being t uh, where those events are taking place in Arab countries it's that they're right in the center of you know happenings around sustainability so for example as you mentioned um, with uh, food security uh, right now uh, with the Ukraine Russia war taking place that you know, food prices are on the rise the, it's a global crisis at the moment in terms of uh, the amount of food that uh, countries are receiving as a result of this and a halt to imports and uh, exports as a result of sanctions and uh, limitations. Um, for particularly the Middle East, which are the highest uh, net importers when it comes to food and, and water, it makes a, it's a very big deal for them. And that's why more so than just joining the global conversation, it's also a matter of really solving that problem from within. So, uh, for example, um, the UAE uh, receives a lot of its food and, uh, and water from uh, countries such as like India and Pakistan. So they know that with global warming, this is a real issue that's uh, affecting them. You know, it's it's a more developed uh, nation where, you know, a lot of developed nations, you know, might say, oh, but we are not uh, as affected by climate change as, you know, under, um, you know, underdeveloped countries, but say, uh, but they know that their food supplies and their supply chains come from these countries. And so it is directly in their hands to address these renewable uh, issues. So when it comes to renewable energy, when it comes to water saving technologies, when it comes to being able to grow uh, food in arid environments, not to necessarily have to rely on uh, imports, because one interesting thing about uh, the the current global crisis, you know, around food is that, say, Russia and Ukraine provide a large uh, percentage of uh, fertilizer uh, exports, and this is a problem that's not only going to affect the increase in food prices at the moment, but these are problems that that are going to happen a year later. So it's so important to be forward thinking about these renewable and sustainable solutions when it comes to energy, when it comes to uh, food tech when it, uh, or agri-tech as it's called, uh, and other um, sustainable type practices on a corporate level to be able to address this on a mass scale. So I think it's definitely pertinent to the region. Uh, they're connected to the uh, global situation and that's why they're gonna have, I think, a lot to say uh, by hosting these events, you know, this year and the next year. Salim, how are the global energy and food crises resulting from the Ukraine war impacting the Gulf and the Middle East ties with the rest of the world? That's a good question. Um, I still think it's uncertain, um, but what we're seeing a lot is uh, a change in relationships. I'd say the latest trends in that area are we. Are, are that we're seeing uh, as a result of, for example, European countries not able to get gas and um, you know other commodities you know from uh, Russia as a result of the war, they're looking elsewhere. And for example, we've seen um, a EU chief, uh, sorry, European Council President Charles Michel refer to Algeria as a reliable reliable gas supplier. We've seen um, relationships between Qatar and uh, UAE with Germany in terms of gas trade. You know, there are new relationships being formed to supplement what's being lost, especially as winter is coming and uh, Europe is a colder region than here. You know, gas is needed and, uh, you know, these relationships are, are, are taking place now uh, to solve that future problem. Salim, as our business correspondent at El Monitor, you have a key role in our concept development and analysis and reporting on business and tech and related trends in the region. What are some of the trends that you're looking at for our pro analysis that others may be missing? I think that's a very important question because what we're doing right now with El Monitor Pro is we're really trying to provide that insider information from the region rather than only about the region. Meaning that we are getting voices from experts that are based here, that are hands-on in a variety of industries that are um, you know, sharing their voices with us. We have memos, for example, that uh, you know, an industry expert would write highlighting their projections. Uh, 
in describing future scenarios that are possible with deep analysis. And the key thing is actionable information versus just saying this is happening. They're saying why it's happening and what you can do about it. And part of the strategy moving forward is that we're trying to address you know, the key industries that readers uh, want to know about. So, uh, of course, you know, as mentioned before, we have the, um, you know, the, the AI, the tech industry, which is uh, developing here where, where maybe, you know, um, globally, people mainly look to the UAE and the Gulf in general uh, when it comes to oil and energy. But there are so many things happening here and across the region uh, that we're looking to highlight. So, for example, um, this, when we just uh, talked a little bit about, you know, the uh, cryptocurrency landscape, you know, here in the UAE, there's also, for example, a movement, you know, with crypto mining in the UAE, but also doing that in a sustainable way. That is something that is uh, that an international investor might be interested in knowing about to be able to be a part of that process and to gain, you know, uh, by investment in that area. So there are a lot of different uh, topics that we're covering and even hypothetical type situations. So uh, one memo that's being worked on at the moment is uh, what happens, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, the region is uh, tied to the dollar, what would happen if in the future that changed? What would be the likely outcomes? How would businesses need to act? These are all questions that, you're not finding necessarily in uh, the typical uh, news article about the region, you know, basically just highlighting that this or that is happening. This is delving into what strategies are taking place, what uh, the type of mindset um, that, you know, decision makers uh, are following, you know, to enact, uh, you know, uh, different strategies and policies within the region. So, you know, we're covering everything from startups in Egypt, um, you know, which has a, 100 million uh, population and is, you know, breaking records regularly in terms of investment in fintech and e-commerce. Uh, you have Jordan, which is a, you know, health tourism capital and the founder of many t uh, tech startups. Uh, you know, we, we delve into, you know, uh, who, are, who are the players there and, um, you know, what that outlook of that is. We're, uh, of course, exploring, you know, the mega projects, you know, across um, uh, you know, the region and in the, in the GCC and elsewhere and identifying not just, you know, the, the typical story about, um, oh, this is a, is this a pipe dream or is it not? We're addressing, you know, the reality on the ground. So for example, one thing that, you know, Neom is offering is the idea of, uh, uh, data rights, which is a, you know, universal concept and this uh, big discussion at the moment. So, even having those discussions about, uh, you know, those are the types of stories that we do to, dis to discuss how are they doing that? What would be the outcome of doing that? What does that actually mean? So the business insider, the decision maker um, who's interested in the region can actually be a part of it versus just reading a a about it from a distance. William, that's an excellent overview of what we're trying to do at Pro. And, and I would just merely add that what we're doing in Pro with the insider type analysis of these business and, and other trends in the region complements what we've been doing at Monitor for more than a decade in terms of regionally driven, uh, sharp analysis of trends in our reporting, uh, which we continue to do and continue to have an unmatched team of correspondents and contributors based in the region and worldwide and, and here in Washington who uh, every day get at the scoops, trends, and news uh, that's shaping the Middle East and impacting uh, the international community. So thank you for uh, explaining that, and thank you for your reporting and analysis and for being on the show today. It's great to have you uh, on, on the Middle East and as a member of the El Monitor team. Thank you so much. That's my pleasure, and I'm really excited about moving forward with El Monitor, and uh, there are great things to come. We will return after this break. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn, and I'm the State Department Correspondent at Al Monitor. And I'm Joe Snell, I'm Al Monitor's video editor. Let's admit it, this past year has been difficult to stay on top of the news and sift through what's accurate and what's misleading. Let Al Monitor help you. If you care about the Middle East and North Africa, you should consider listening to Al Monitor's audio series on the Middle East with Andrew Parasoliti and Amber and Zaman, and on Israel with Ben Caspi. 
You can now watch our newest video podcast, Reading the Middle East with Gilles Capel. You can subscribe to these series on your favorite podcast platforms. And through a host of free daily and weekly newsletters, we offer a range of perspectives with the highest journalistic standards. You can subscribe to these newsletters at almonitor.com. As an award-winning media service headquartered in Washington, D.C., Almonitor has a network of over 160 contributors around the world. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to visit almonitor.com, where you can find all of these newsletters and podcasts, along with first-class reporting and analysis. Thanks to our guest today, Salima Seed, and our production team of Beowulf Rockland and Rosabel Hine of Two Squared Media Productions. We will be back next week, and if you haven't done so, please sign up for both of our podcasts at your favorite podcast platform, On Israel with Ben Caspit, where Ben this week speaks with Israel's Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Orit Farkash Akohen. And of course, this podcast on the Middle East, where Amber and Zaban will be here next week with another decision maker or thought leader in the region. Thank you all for listening, and please keep up with all of the news and trends in the Middle East at lmonitor.com.